Welcome everyone to the 30-minute Midas Touch from beautiful Dyersburg, Tennessee at the Herb Welsh Wrestleplex. Now, here is pound for pound and inch for inch, the best of the best in professional wrestling today. A wrestling genius worth his weight in gold. The Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 30-minute Midas Touch. Hope you enjoyed my very humble intro that I have. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, it is what it is. I am the Golden Boy, Greg Anthony, and with me as always is my co-host. Um, you're gonna, I think you're going to like this one. Oh, I can't wait. Um, my co-host... <laughs> Uh, we wish him best in his future endeavors. Oh, no. Mark Tipton. Oh, no. Are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> no. Merely merely a joke. But no, yeah. no. I do, I do understand. Uh, and this moniker, although uh, not a pleasant one, and I do appreciate you trying to bring a little levity to this situation. Right. Uh, the subject of this week's edition of the 30-Minute Midas Touch podcast is is once again something that has me uh, rather aggravated. Uh, once again, the unhappy co-host of your program, Mark Tipton, is here because uh, that uh, the phraseology there you just used, I think I may have just invented a word, uh, as far as future endeavored, is a very clear reference for those of us that are long-term uh, watchers of the WWE. That's phraseology that is often used when a talent is released. And this week... Uh, we had a rather significant number of WWE talents who are no longer WWE talents. Um, they, it was a release of, my understanding, it was a total of 18 talents. Um, some you would know more than the others, but we'll kind of go over that as we go along. But this aggravates me greatly as a fan of professional wrestling in general. And obviously WWE is the flagship of professional wrestling, whether they like it or not. They are, but we're going to discuss... The subject at hand this week, the WWE releases. Yeah, and I, like I said, you know, it's um, it's never good when someone loses their job. You know, obviously that's it's a huge, um, um, it's like the loss of a loved one. You know, when you get fired from a position uh, like that, you know, let go. Um, you know, there was a lot of surprising releases in this, and you know. Lots of implications about, you know, what's going to happen next and stuff like that. I think the thing that bothers me the most is guys that were never really given an opportunity to get off the ground. You know what I mean? Uh, wrestling is, like a, like we talk about it here on the 30 Minute Minus Touch, wrestling is a very organic thing. It needs to develop, you know, organically in front of your eyes. And some people have uh, a really huge upside and it just didn't seem like they were um allowed to capitalize on it you know so <clears throat> excuse me one comment i probably should have been in to the very top of the beginning uh part of my aggravation uh is that this has become a rather frequent occurrence uh now over the years i have come to expect this in the days following wrestlemania it kind of serves as the end of their year so to speak fiscal year, their yeah. fiscal year so in wrestling terms i'm mean, no they're publicly traded and they have quarterly reports etc but uh it is you know kind of become commonplace that in the days shortly after wrestlemania that there are a number of talents released uh before they you know kind of begin anew uh but this recently has become i mean and i may be off on this but it feels like it's become a quarterly thing Oh, because we had one back during the summer, and now here we are again, and it se and it almost feels like it coincides with uh, their quarterly statements they had to produce as a publicly traded company. And this frequency is is a constant irritation to me as a fan. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think we shouldn't really uh, diminish the fact that I think AEW plays a huge part in this, because it wasn't that long ago we were talking about um, how WWE was offering extended contracts to all these certain wrestlers to keep them on long term so they wouldn't jump ship and go to AEW and now that they've seen what AEW produces and the majority of they because my theory is and I'm sure everyone will agree with me AEW can't hire everyone 
No. And that's WWE kind of calling their bluff on stuff like that. Oh, you want to steal our talent? Well, we just released 18 people. <laughs> Do you have room for any of these guys on your right? AEW legitimately does not have any room. No. For uh, They may be able to pick up one here or there. Yeah. Uh, and in all honesty, they... All right, this is it's time for me to start waving the AEW banner here. I am sure. the on this program. I'm the flag waver for AEW. Uh, my understanding is they do have a uh, dip levels of contracts. One that particularly allows them to work out with outside promotions mm -hmm. to where it's, it sounds more like a pay per appearance, mm -hmm. uh, but you get the um, you know kind of the national recognition of a national promotion I'm right. I'm related with. Although you may not be exclusive to AEW. Right. Uh, so they could fit some people under that. I'm, I would think they could do something like that, uh, and they may be able to. I do not know what their financial situation is. They are not publicly traded, as far as I know. They don't have to release any of their information to anyone. Um, but, and I'm sure they will try to do what they can. But this, and I do want to come back to what you said because WWE did do this. As the AEW was getting started, they did, and it was you know well known. They offered uh, people extended contracts, sometimes at significant raises. Even um, I believe that um, the team now known as the Good Brothers, Carl Anderson and um, Luke Gallows, I believe they were some that it may have been in you know negotiating that kind of thing and went back and forth. And if for whatever reason they found their way out of the company. Uh, but they brought it up among others that they were, it was kind of trying to prevent AEW kind of nip it in the bud situation. Right. It, yeah. I mean, especially with the good brothers, I think the, I think the number for them was something like 500 grand a piece. Right. You know what I mean? And, but they signed that and then six months later, WWE released them too. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know what? What rhyme or reason do they have? We don't know. You know, we don't. We're not in the in the boardroom or in the office when they when they make those decisions. But you know, uh, I think you know. I, I see on your pad there you got Nick Khan written down. Yes, and that's and that's one of the things we discussed a couple of weeks ago was Nick Khan's belief that uh, WWE should be looking other places than independent wrestling for new talent. Mm -hmm. So it would it would. If you and if you look at the list of people that were released, majority of them are from independent promotions originally. Largely, and, yes. Yeah, largely, and um, they were trying to make their way into the uh, make their way within the WWE. Um, so it almost feels like he's trying to. I wouldn't say clean slate, but like he's trying to let's get some of those people out of the way so we can get you know some of these ex-football players, ex-Olympians, ex-whatevers to come in and try to be the next big thing. Yes, you are hearing me sigh heavily on the, sigh on, heavily on the on other this end. side of the table. Yes, now, I know the name of Nick Khan, but I'm not tremendously familiar with his background. I do not know that he has any background in professional wrestling whatsoever. I um, would almost venture to say he does not. <laughs> as, as far as I knew, he was he was hired on the business side. Of, right. And, and I... And, uh, his influence on the talent side is a real irritant to me, and that's why I had his name written down. I wanted to talk about this gentleman, cause, and I need to find out more to know if he actually knows anything about professional wrestling. He may have the kind of standard look down upon professional wrestling yeah. view that I that I run across from time to time as I go within the public. There, yeah. there are great members of the public who think, well, if the outcome is predetermined, anybody can do that. No, no. As a fan, I have witnessed what happens when anyone tries to do it, and I can tell you the difference as a member of the audience. And and I'm going to use the word customer again. A long time WWE customer. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a real aggravation for me. They really believe that someone can come in and go through some kind of I don't know boot camp or or something, relatively short training period. That's why this came up at the recent um, tryout they had in Las, I believe it was in Las Vegas, yeah. uh, where they said, well, we, you know, we're gonna, we found some really exciting people, and you know, they seem to think that you can run them through a two- to three-month period and just get them up to speed, and then we can just, you know, just kind of spit them out there. You know, it's like producing widgets at your factory. We're just going to run them off the assembly line, and a top-notch WWE talent is made. 
I beg to differ. Yeah, and that's that's part of their thought process of um, the fact that they are that these talents are in WWE automatically makes them better than everyone else, and that's just not the case. Like, and I said this to, to young guys that come around me all the time. Like, it t- it takes you a little bit to kind of find yourself to understand who you are and what actually works for you. You know what I mean? I tried, even though I've always been the golden boy, Greg Anthony, like I tried several, you know, different things over the years to was throw that against the wall and see what stuck, you know? And you just have to have that mentality when you're going through stuff because, you know, you can get bogged down and you can get typecasted into, you know, one particular whatever. And um, I really think that, that teaching them, quote unquote, one way, you know what I mean, it is really detrimental to them right. as a whole. I mean, look at guys that, like Drew McIntyre. Obviously, he flourished once he got out from under WWE because he had something to prove. But also, he went out and, and he had to make something on, on his own. You know what I mean? He had to he had to reinvent himself. Right, to, and he did. And he did very, very well. I mean, and that's that's a huge thing. Same thing, I, Jinder Mahal. You know, I love mm-hmm. Jinder to death. And he, um, you know, he came back and he looked phenomenal. You know what I mean? He he completely changed his entire appearance. You know, I mean, he went from a, you know, WWE superstar to, wow, look at that guy. You know what right. I mean? So, um, it, it's a little, you know, back and forth. You know, six in this hand, half a dozen in the other, you know. But, like, what it all comes down to is, um, you know, you, you have to give time to develop organically. Right. And, and, um, a, a book I came across one many years ago when I was in school. There was a, a class I took that we we read the McDonaldization of society, or and I, I was struggling if I was going to be able to get that word out. So I'm I'm right. I'm rather happy with myself. I got that out that time, and I, I think it was understandable what I was saying. But I think that's what they're trying to do. I think that the the Nick Cons of the world think that um, talent and professional wrestlers can be produced the way McDonald's has and just, you know, replicate the way they've done mm-hmm. with franchises around the world. You know, this is how we make. And, every, you know, a Big Mac tastes the same wherever you go. Yeah. And and we can just churn them out, churn them out, mm-hmm. and, and mass produce them, so to speak. I don't think it works that way. I think there's far more to it. And I don't think that these people, namely Nick Khan, among others, appreciate what it takes to become, and the example for me to cite is I'm going to go straight to Stone Cold Steve Austin. Okay. Now, at the national level, people may look at Stone Cold Steve Austin and think, well, there's a guy that caught on rather, you know, rather quickly there. He, he wasn't you know, nationally known, and then became, in a relatively short time period, became the biggest thing and really a star outside professional wrestling even. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did have movie roles and TV roles and things and, and became well-known even outside of wrestling circles. But that didn't happen overnight. No. And that's always a misconception. Is like when someone... And it, it, don't don't get me wrong, it has happened in wrestling. Um, Goldberg, for instance. But I mean... Right. And look... Well... Yeah. <laughs> he would be an example, I would say. Yeah, is, yeah, right. Right. But Stone Cold, you know, like you said, he, he had been working eight years up until that point. So he was, he was just kind of hitting his stride as far as his talent goes. And like I said, it took him a little bit to find out exactly who he was and what worked for him, you know. I remember him talking about a story of riding down the road with Dutch Mantell. And Dutch Mantell used to, you know, pick apart their matches and pick apart their gimmicks and just, you know, you know, give them the what for on, you know, what professional wrestling is all about. You know, education and pro wrestling one-on-one every night in the car. And uh, Stone Cold said, he looked at him one time and said, what – you're stunning Steve Austin. What's so stunning about you? You know what I mean? And it kind of resonated with, with Steve. He was like, he's like, well, that, that's a good point. Right. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a good point. So it, in WCW, you can see the transformation of him from long hair, blonde, mm-hmm. chicken shit, heel, you know, that kind of thing to steadily progressing to more aggressive, you know, more uh, you know, cut his hair off, grew a beard. You know, started to become more rugged, you know, that kind of thing. And then when he got to the ECW. There you go. There you go. I mean, he just, he just. The, the know, change was noticeable. Yeah. He, during he, his time there. Superstar Steve, you know. Right. I mean, he, it was The whole thing was that he was, he was bigger and then he was better than anyone in ECW. Right. This you know? is a bunch of violent crap. This is a bunch of violent crap. 
I love that's one of my favorite promos of all time. <laughs> but um, yeah, Stone Cold is a is a uh, a beautiful example of, that. of and and this is and it's just this dismissive view of the and I'm going to use the word art and professional wrestling that aggravates me. And when I see WWE has truly become the monolithic corporation, the nameless, faceless, and I have often thought that that is something that is not compatible with professional wrestling, at least being being done successfully. Uh, I thought WCW demonstrated that. Well, another thing, too, is, and we've talked about this before, the, the corporate structure is not conducive to professional wrestling. You understand, like, and a lot of people will say, oh, it's toxic masculinity, or it's bullying, or it's this kind of stuff. No, it's just, this business is really tough, and it's always been really tough, and there has to be, you know, guardians of the gate that, you know, that protect the business at all costs and make people earn what they're, what they're going to get. Um, and that's, that's my personal belief. So, the corporate structure has never really, you know, really helped that train of thought you know what i mean because they have hr departments and people that have never took a bump in a ring and you know things like that like if someone said oh uh you know so-and-so broke my jaw so i came to the back and i you know punched him in the face well hr will go well that's not really you know this is an environment you know their their position would be oh that's we don't want Mm -hmm. any fight you know obviously it was an accident blah 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 but as a professional wrestler you know that if someone breaks your jaw Right. Then you're not going to be able to wrestle. Ergo, you're not going to be able to make money. Ergo, you're not going to put food on the table, and it actually hurts you. And that's that's where you have to teach someone, hey, this is the way the business actually works. You know what I mean? Yes. One one great example of that is um, Ron Simmons when he was Farouk. Um, apparently, um, Ahmed Johnson had hurt yes. had hurt him significantly, where he was out for many many months. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, like, the first night that uh, Ron Simmons was back, they put him with Ahmed Johnson. Mm. And, uh, like, somebody said they came up and was, was trying to talk to Ron, and he just blew him off. He's like, get away from me. I'm getting ready. You know, that kind of – he was really unrealistic. I'm mean, not unrealistic, mm-hmm. but uncharacteristically, you know, short right. with him. And, and what he was doing, he was getting himself psyched up for what he had to do. Mm-hmm. And apparently he went out there and beat the living shit at Ahmed Johnson and put him on the shelf for a little bit too. Right. You know what I mean? Just as a receipt of what well, was Well, yeah, the the uh the bad blood between those two is something that even I'd heard about, you know, not someone who delves into all the backstage rumors, but that one has made it to me. I understood those individuals had a serious problem with one another. And uh very quickly, I want to get back to specifically the releases we had this week a little bit later. But on this I want to try to put a, an example on this point I'm making. Uh, during, I do not know if you watched this, but during the Halloween Havoc on quote-unquote NXT, unquote, a 2.0, using those letters with that, promote, that, that program are not uh, fitting in my opinion, but I just call it 2.0 or 2% or something. Right. But they had, uh, they mildly surprised with the outcome of this match, but they had Tommaso Ciampa defending the NXT Championship against Braun Breaker, who is clearly a favorite of the upper management of WWE. Sure. During that match, and I don't know if you saw the match or not. I did watch that one. Okay. There was a point where Braun Breaker went to the uh, second rope, and it looked to me like he was going to spring off and do a bulldog similar to the way his dad did coming off the top rope, is what it looked like he was intended to do. Yeah. He had done several other Steiner maneuvers during this yeah. match. Uh, he slipped on the ropes and fell uh, fell flat on his face. Right. Um, this is Hey, this is a guy who has not had years of deep experience. And I saw Tommaso Ciampa, in my opinion, you can tell me if I read this wrong, immediately go get him and pin him and then, and then you know, kind of took charge of the situation to keep because this was a main event match. Yeah. It really liked Tommaso went in there, went for the pin and was – in my and it looked like he was kind of giving him some direction and where you know here's what's going to happen and mm-hmm. took charge of the match. What could have been a disaster? Disaster, yeah. If he was in the ring with someone who was less experienced than Tommaso Ciampa, who has made his way up the ranks uh, over the years. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that comes to being a, a ring general and like you said, the experience level. Uh, actually, something similar happened to us, you know, in Ripley many years ago. We were like an, an eight-man tag or something like that, and the top rope snapped, 
like in the beginning of the eight man tag. Okay. Right. And of course we're in there. It's like me and flash Flanagan and Derek King and a, and a bunch of guys like that. Like we, we didn't panic, but we're in with a bunch of young guys and they started like, Oh shit, what do we do? And we just took control and like, it ended up being a really, really good, ma- much better than it should have been with the top rope being gone. Right. Sure. And then we get to the back and, uh, actually, uh, the cameraman, the guy that comes and takes all the pictures, he came to the back. He was like, man, that was, that was awesome. How'd you guys know how to do that? And we just kind of looked at him and said, this ain't our first rodeo. You know what I mean? And that's what happened. That's why experience is so, there's no substitute for experience because, uh, you know what to do in certain situations and how to, how to make them, uh, the, the best of a bad situation, I guess. Okay. Um, I do want to try to get back on the, on this week's events, uh, I, I thank you for indulging me as I, I took us off on a bit of a tangent there. Uh, I, and I do want to note that these the releases were not strictly the talent, by the way. Uh, there were members of the staff, uh, some of, and at least one of whom who had a vice president title associated with their name. Mm-hmm. I believe it was, uh, I forgot the lady's name, I did not write it down, a lady who had served as an assistant to Stephanie McMahon, a vice president uh, of branding, which I believe would be directly under Stephanie, or someone that Stephanie had even referenced in a tweet of some sort I saw. Right. Um, so it's not strictly um, talent, but it you know the talent gets the headlines, so to speak, because yeah. it's people we know. Yeah. Um, look, well, let's start with one that kind of surprised me. Uh, one that stood out to me was Nia Jax. Now, the reason it stood out to me is because I know, and I think everyone knows, she is a cousin of The Rock. Right. And she's, obviously, The Rock is someone they want to maintain a good relationship with uh, for various business reasons. And, obviously, releasing, you know, someone related to him would be jeopardizing that, and they released her. Yeah, and I think that's, with The Rock, for instance, I mean, not only do they have Roman... The Usos. Right. Well, they just hired the the third brother, I think. Yes. And, and I forgot what name he's wrestling I forgot, under, yeah, but, I but he is appearing on the NXT right. 2.0. 2%? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so they've got, already got those four people hired, so I, I don't think letting Nia Jax would really hurt his relationship with The Rock. I mean, I don't think Nia Jax is a hill that The Rock is going to die on. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, I'm sure they're close, and he loves her, but I mean – at the same time, business is business, and mm-hmm. I, I think that The Rock would look at that objectively as far as her being kind of sloppy and her not taking care of, well, of, of uh, people and, and things of that nature. I mean, that kind of stuff hurts business. And uh, Actually, Nia Jax had, had tweeted after this that she actually was on a mental health break mm-hmm. that she asked for for the company, and then they sent her some dates of when she was going to be back, and she asked for an extended break, and she never heard back, and then she got released. Right. You know, and that's kind of, you know, I, I obviously, you know, people that have mental health issues, I, you know, I, I wish them all the best, and I want things, but at the same time, you know, we are talking about a business. You're being paid to perform. You're being paid to make the dates and things like that. You have to have a monicum of you know, respect for that right. as far as the show must go on. The show must go on. I mean, there, we all have, like I tell my guys, like we all have wives, we all have kids, we all have lives outside of wrestling, but it doesn't need to interfere with wrestling. If you tell me you're going to be here, be here. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, there was another name and this one somewhat surprised me because of just where they were recently. Uh, now I don't know how many of the listeners are, are, you know, intimately familiar with the the group Hit Row. They had just been brought up to SmackDown two week, approximately two weeks before this happened, and they had a female member of the group named B-Fab. Uh, and that she was one of those released. Mm-hmm. Now, this talking about this is a group that you just put on national television, broadcast television, less than two weeks ago. Obviously, you had some interest in this person and thought they could, you know, do good business for you. And you're dropping them that quickly after they just made their debut. And for the record, I did notice uh, she had she had, evidently she actually sang a part of their entrance song, kind of the I guess you'd call it the hook, the mm-hmm. hit row. That I can't sing, but I can't do <laughs> it. But I did notice last night on SmackDown that that had been removed from their <laughs> entrance music. 
you did not hear her. Although Pat McAfee at ringside did emulate it as he was talking about oh. the group, he and that brought it out even more. Right, but right. when they made their entrance, you did not hear that as you had always had previously. So, I mean, obviously I'm speculating, but I mean, that sounds like she did something wrong, right? Uh, I, I, that's, that has that, not come out yet, but that makes me wonder. Yeah, that, that sounds like she said the wrong thing to the wrong person and okay, she's gone and let's, let's erase any, <laughs> any, uh, I, we don't want to come back and say we owe her residuals for this hook in this song. So let's, we don't want to pay her a dime anymore ever again. You know, that's kind of what that sounds like. And I could, like I said, could be wrong, but like, that's kind of the way it reads to me. Okay. Um, well, I guess we, there, there's still one name that I do have to get to who I, who I consider the main event of this. But one thing that we've heard is that uh, the official release referenced all these cuts and and uh, the names of the Total Weight Teen are available to everyone. And uh, we, uh, we certainly won't make it to all of them in this discussion. But do, uh, if you're interested, it is available online. They referenced that these were quote-unquote budget cuts. And quite frankly, the 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 rationale I've heard behind these uh, has not rung true to me, and I want to see if this is strictly my misinterpretation. But they were referenced as budget cuts. Now, as I mentioned, they just released a quarterly statement which indicated they had revenues of 250, approximately 250 million. Someone can look up and tell the exact number. But over $200 million in revenue, not, not gross. My, my understanding is that they're talking about net profit of $200 million in the quarter which was approximately, I believe, is a 15% year-over-year increase, and that would, as I was informed. And at the same time this is happening, you're putting that out, you're telling me that people are being released for budget cuts? Uh, maybe they're budget cuts on something on the horizon. Maybe they know something that's coming up as far as maybe one of their TV deals or something of that nature. Okay. And, you know, they could, they could use that as the, well, we, we got this, basically this bill, coming up you know in the next couple months and we need to cut you know i don't know how much do you say they cut 300 grand 500 grand something something yeah. else, somewhere in there you know um off the off the budget you know so who knows who knows uh anyway but in in the when you're reporting year over year remarkable increases that yeah. don't it just didn't ring true to me maybe there's something more to it um we really, I really do want to get to what I consider to be the big name of this because this is a, a talent who I've been frustrated with his treatment by the WWE, and that is Keith Lee. And no, I'm not going to call him Bearcat. <laughs> I didn't mind the Bearcat thing. I mean, well, I, it fit. I mean, it was. Well, and you know I, me, I love traditional. Right. Well, I know, appreciate names. the tradition, but it it felt like something that was foisted upon him. Yeah, quite possibly. Keith Keith is a. Um, He's a really good guy. Like we worked with him, and I didn't. We didn't wrestle each other, but we worked in the same locker room down in Texas. And like Keith Lee is is one of the guys that I I was wrong about. <laughs> I saw Keith Lee, and he was as big as he is doing all those cruiserweight things. And I actually told him, "Hey, no, wrestle bigger. <laughs> you know, I me mean, wrestle like a big guy." And I was completely wrong in that scenario because. Him wrestling like a cruiserweight is what got him noticed and got him eventually to the spot that he had. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, the treatment of him over the last, you know, a couple of years has been kind of hot and cold, you know. And Thank you. And, like, to me, like, the moment that he came out in the Royal Rumble mm -hmm. and Lesnar put him over the way he did right. and reacted to this big guy, like, oh, here's, here's somebody who can give me a run for my money. As soon as that happened, he should have been a made man. He, right. sh he should have had a rocket strapped to his ass Thank you. And, and go from there. But, like, they constantly, like I said, hot and cold. They they push someone for a little bit, and then they bury him for a little bit. And then they push someone for a little bit, and they bury him for a little bit. And then after a couple of years of that, they're they're pretty much worthless to the product because no one believes in them anymore, you know? Yeah, and and the, the fits and starts. And the, the recent incarnation of the Bearcat – they clearly want him to be more aggressive or something. Um, yeah, he he had he had a view as you know a very positive, fan friendly kind of guy, and they had been trying to change that. Or now the reference of Bearcat to for traditionalists, I do understand, um, and I, I appreciate that. But he would be 
and there's another one on this list that I may get to momentarily if time allows, of instances where I saw someone from my NXT. Mm -hmm. I want to make clear, not that thing you see on Tuesdays now. The My NXT, he was someone who came from there, had success there, and then came up, and, and at the outset, I thought, well, okay, I, you mentioned the Royal Rumble. I thought, oh, well, here we go. This is a guy we're going to, you know, you know, the, what is it, bask in my glory. That's what that was. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, we had that. We're going to take this, and we're going to run with this guy. And then in relatively short order, I couldn't find him. Well, where, what, what happened? Where did he go? Yeah. Uh, he disappeared from the scene. And then he did have a, a health absence earlier in the year. I do understand that, and that was part of it. But then he came back in this form I didn't quite get or understand and uh, let me see I, and I'm going to tr get the name in uh, another one who has uh, who exemplifies the same situation as Keith Lee at least for me as a fan is Karrion Cross. yeah I mean I can understand how a lot of people are, are shocked by that one me personally I'm not really a fan of him like t to me I mean to me he's just he's good but he's not that great yet he's like he's gonna be good in five or ten years but he's still got a ways to go as, as i say about some guys is you know he needs to go back in the oven for a little bit until he's actually done <laughs> well therein therein is my issue why would you bring him out of nxt if if that was the case and and i could accept that argument if you told me that but Okay, this this is fan talk. Mm -hmm. I see a talent wearing an NXT championship. He appears on the same network as Raw. 24 hours after Raw goes off, NXT came on the same network. He is there as their champion on network television. He comes to Monday Night Raw, makes his debut, and is defeated in a minute and a half by Jeff Hardy. Yeah. What is it, What are you saying about what you think about? Are, are you not... You don't know nose despite your face situation, anyone. Well, it's it's more of a situation of the left hand don't care what the right hand does, right? So if 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 you're pushed in in NXT because of Triple H or whoever right. is making that decision, and you get the Raw and it's Vince's decision, and he don't see the same talent level or the same whatever in you that Triple H saw, then you're not going to get off the starting blocks. And I'm I'm completely with you on it as far as there needs to be continuity. Right. I would definitely want to have continuity. Well, if you're USA, what do you what are right. you, what are you doing? But then they then they also change them into the gladiator gimmick, which right. was horrid. The gladiator gimmick has never worked for anybody. No. Like if Ron Simmons couldn't get it over. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like if Ron Simmons that that, that helmet he wore. Yeah. Oh. If I mean, and that's the thing too. Like you come out in one of those things, and like no one can recognize you because you've got a helmet on. I mean, what's it right. just it holds no significance to anything. So everyone that's ever tried to do that particular gimmick has failed miserably, so All right. Well that well, and we talked about the difference in the way you're treated on NX on the real NXT as the way you did when you appear on Raw. Well, I guess you could say they've corrected that problem now, haven't they? Right. Um, uh, much to my chagrin once again. Right. Um and there are a number of others. I know that uh, Grand Metal League, Lince Dorado, uh, and one, oh, Frankie Monet, uh, the wife of John Morrison. Yeah, it almost sounds like he's almost on the way out too, though. Yeah, he's doing some peculiar things on television at the moment as well. Yeah, it sounds like. And that's what they, they do too. Is Someone's got a little bit of buzz. Mm -hmm. Someone's got a little bit of momentum behind them on the independent scene. And, okay, we'll take that. They take it and just squash it pretty much and then send them back and they're not nearly as over as they were when they went right unfortunately john morrison is another guy that kind of reinvented himself he was the champion everywhere yeah he, he was johnny impact he was yes. johnny whatever promotion he was what, what was the See, lucha johnny lucha johnny mundo oh yeah johnny mundo yeah, yeah i believe it was johnny mundo and johnny impact wherever he was i know. think i made a joke about when he was actually here for us i yeah. call him a johnny mid-south well sure why and he was like <laughs> go ahead why not I yeah i don't give a shit <laughs> So, um, I, I just think, you know, when they do stuff like that, you know, it, it's kind of writing on the wall that they're trying to put the husband in a bad position. You know, they've done that before where two people were dating and they put one on SmackDown and one on Raw so they couldn't travel together. And obviously that's going to cause distance between them and, <laughs> right. and all kinds of stuff. So, 
well, the long and short of all this, these releases, uh, I, I don't understand the business rationale when you're having, you know, quote unquote record profits. I don't understand the, the, uh, storyline side when I see the effect it has. And then, well, thing I haven't even mentioned was what does this do for locker room morale? Um, the main, the people who remain behind, what does this affect them? From my understanding, locker room morale is has always been low. You know what I mean? Okay. Like it's it's pretty much just guys walking on eggshells, not trying to not get released. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then they some guys do everything right and still get released. You know, so it's kind of you know there's no there's no continuity. Back to continuity, there's no continuity in in any of it. So here we are. We're um. We're well over time. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're at 35 minutes. Oh, this week. excuse us. So, um, for myself, the Golden Boy Greg Anthony, and for my co-host, uh, wishing you best in your future endeavors, <laughs> Mark Tipton, thank you and goodbye.